Hey everyone, it's Professor Clark, and in this lecture, we are going to learn about the nominative plural of nouns. In our last lecture, we learned about the nominative singular ending of nouns, and in this lecture, we're going to learn about the nominative plural endings for nouns. Let's start off with a quick discussion of what is the nominative plural. Uh, the nominative plural is the plural form of nouns in the nominative. It's used to indicate the subject uh, or the predicate complement. So the subject of a verb, uh, the subject of a sentence, whatever is doing the action in the sentence, or the predicate complement. So when something is something, that something that it is is also in the nominative. And then nominative plural endings come in hard and soft form. Remember that I told you in the last lecture that all nouns and adjectives are either hard stem or soft stem. And this is going to carry through in all of the forms, all of the case endings uh, for all nouns. So what are these nominative plural endings? They are going to be ui, that hard back ui sound, for masculine and feminine hard stem nouns. So document, a document or an ID, becomes documently with the hard ui. Mama, mama, becomes mommy with that hard ui. And then, um, if you remember, the soft equivalent of ui is e, and so we're just going to use that for soft stem nouns, masculine and feminine soft stem nouns. So geroi, a hero, is going to become geroi with that soft e. Titrait, a notebook, is going to become titraji with that soft e. Note that we drop the ikratkoya or the myakiznak at the end of the noun and replace it with e. And then for neuter, the hard stem nouns are going to add a. So we will drop the o and add a. Akno, okna. We'll talk more about stress shift later. And then the soft pair or the soft partner for a is ya. And so it makes sense that for neuter soft stem nouns, we're going to drop our ye and add ya. Zanyati ye, a college class, becomes zanyati ya. Before going any further, we should talk a little bit about the seven letter spelling rule. Um, there are three spelling rules in Russian and Galasa, our textbook, has given them names based on the number of letters that they affect. So these names are not commonly used in Russian, they're just used by our textbook. Uh, but nonetheless, they're very useful to know. And I will normally refer to them by the names that Galasa gives them. So this is the seven letter spelling rule. And the seven letter spelling rule says that after velers and hushers, you cannot write ui, you must write e. And you might have gone, what are these velers and hushers you're talking about? Velers are sounds you make in the back of your mouth with your velum. And those sounds in Russian are g, k, and h. So Russian has three velers, g, k, h. And they are included in the seven letter spelling rule. And then hushers are sounds you make that have a sh sound in them. And so there are four or five of them in Russian. As you're going to see, um, the letter tz um, is not included in the seven letter spelling rule, but it is included in the other spelling rules. So it's sort of an honorary half husher. But the seven letter spelling rule only cares about the fully fledged hushers, zh, ch, sh, sh. So those are the seven letters, g, k, h, and zh, ch, sh, sh. And after these letters, you cannot write the hard u, you must write the soft e. Now, what you pronounce depends on the consonant. So g, k, h will all become soft. And if you write the soft e after them, they will be pronounced as soft and you will pronounce that soft e. 
With hushers, hushers are all either intrinsically hard or intrinsically soft. And so j and sh are intrinsically hard, and ch and sh are intrinsically soft. So after j and sh, you will write e, but you will pronounce e. After ch and sh, you will write e and you will pronounce e. That might seem pretty complicated, but it will start to make sense after you go over it a few dozen, maybe a few hundred times. It's not really that hard, right? And so this affects masculine and feminine nouns in the nominative plural. Uh, so for example, sabaka, dog, becomes sabaki. The stem ends in a ka, so we have to add e, not u. Bank, a bank, becomes banki. Uchebnik, a textbook, uchebniki. Kniga, a book, knigi. Studentka, a female student, studentki. Amerikanka, a female American, Amerikanki. In the last slide, I mentioned that sometimes in the nominative plural, uh, you get stress shifts. And this happens uh, particularly with disyllabic words, so words of two syllables. And what happens very often is that there are many disyllabic words, words with two syllables, that are stressed on the second syllable in the singular, and then the stress shifts to the first syllable in the plural. So akno, window, becomes okna, windows. Ruka, hand or arm, becomes ruki, hands or arms. This is the most common pattern. Uh, if you have an N-stressed word, so a word that's on the last syllable in the singular, it can also shift on to the ending when you add an ending. So note that akno and ruka do not increase their number of syllables when we add the ending. Instead, they shift stress. Uh, but their next two words, slavar, dictionary, and sekretar, a male secretary, when we add an ending, we actually add a syllable, and that stress is going to shift onto that syllable that we add. So slavar, dictionary, becomes slavari, dictionaries. Sekretar, male secretary, becomes sekretari, male secretaries. Another thing that shows up in the nominative plural are fleeting vowels. And Russian has these fleeting vowels, and there are these uh, complex historical reasons for why this is, but basically Russian used to have more vowels than it does now. That is to say words, Russian words, had more vowels in them. And we now have these vowels that are kind of these like ring wraith vowels that are kind of half here in the land of the living, half not, and they disappear under certain circumstances, or they will suddenly appear seemingly out of nowhere under certain circumstances. And what triggers the appearance or disappearance of these vowels is adding or removing an ending. And so where we're going to find them in the nominative plural is that masculine nouns ending in ok or yets often, not always, but often lose their o or ye when an ending is added. So for example, padarek, a present, becomes padarki. We drop the o before the ka when we add an ending to the ka. Amerikanets, an American man, becomes Amerikansi, American men. We drop that ye before the ts when we add an ending. Kanadets, a Canadian man, becomes Kanadzi, Canadian men. Atets, a father, becomes Atsi, fathers. Some masculine nouns, not a huge number, but some that are very important, form the plural by adding a stressed a uh, or very occasionally ya rather than e or e. And you can't know these nouns by looking at them. You just have to memorize them. 
Uh, the textbook has a list of some common ones. Uh, some other common ones include dom, house, becomes dama, houses. Gorid, city, becomes garada, cities. Uchitil, a male teacher, becomes uchitilia, male teachers. And then finally, we have indeclinable nouns. Uh, so all Russian nouns, nouns of Russian origin, will decline, but there are some nouns of foreign origin that don't decline. And these include all nouns of foreign origin, ending in e, o, or u, and then most nouns of foreign origin ending in ye. Examples of this type of noun are coffee, coffee, cafe, cafe, taxi, taxi, radio, radio, zombie, zombie. And so there you have it. That is your introduction to the nominative plural. Hopefully it's not too overwhelming. Uh, just remember you can listen to this lecture several times and we will go over it a bunch in class. And the most important thing is to try to expose yourself to Russian as much as possible so you see these endings in the wild and you see how they are being used. So take a deep breath, maybe take a little break because this was a pretty heavy lecture, and then uh, we will keep on working on Russian.